Back again with another shallow dive on another one of the country's large but potentially slept on stocks because it seems like something that y'all are interested in. I did get requests for both Huja and Celtrion which I'll be working on after this one. This one was just already in the lab so I'll get back to you guys ASAP. Anyways, you're watching Sekidur and today we're waiting in the waters of Amore Pacific. Now before we continue, we just want to remind you that this channel is meant for general education purposes only and isn't meant to replace the legal or financial advice from a paid professional. When it comes to investments, it's always healthy to take a fair bit of skepticism to everything you hear regardless of the source, including us. Anytime you hear somebody, whether us or otherwise, mention a stock, it should be standard practice to assume that they have some position on the stock, and for that reason requires fact checking and due diligence when looking into the companies for yourself. Want to know how? Well, if you scroll down a tiny bit and hit the like and subscribe buttons, we'll do our best to help you figure out how to figure out this game for yourself. That being said, let's get to it. Now if you've never heard of Amore Pacific, I can guarantee you, you know at least one if not more of their subsidiaries. Up front, Amore Pacific is best recognized as a cosmetics and beauty conglomerate with dozens of brands in that sector that I'm sure you've seen around including but not limited to Innisfree, Solhuasu, Hera, Etude, La Neige, Happy Bath, and Mise en Scene. They're currently sitting at a market cap of about 12 billion US dollars or just shy of 14 trillion won at the end of July. And that puts their market cap in the same range as companies like LG Corp, SK Corp, and Samsung Life Insurance. It's been listed in both the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for 10 years as well as the FTSE for Good Index for just shy of the same time with an MSCI ESG rating of AA. And with respect to their stock price, they've seen a bit of a dip in recent months and today we're going to investigate why. Now once again, and lucky for us, Amora Pacific puts out English language earning reports which makes the process much easier. We're going to be using some of their reports today and I will link the page to their IR materials in the comment section below. Now as usual, they've reported both their top and bottom line earnings for both the second quarter and the first half of the year right at the top for our convenience. Now as a positive thing that we see right off the bat is the massive growth in both operating and net profits when compared to the first half of last year. They've also turned from a loss to a profit in their overseas operations in that time. This is really great news of course, but it's important that we remain cognizant of the role that the low base from last year's earnings plays in these statistical improvements between 2020 and 2021. This is especially true for the retail sector which was hit extremely hard due to lockdown protocols and the extreme reduction of foot traffic to brick and mortars all around the world. With the way that much of the second quarter of this year has played out as vaccination rates have increased leading to more travel and a somewhat higher uptick in foot traffic in physical stores, it's not surprising to see a large return to earnings. However, if we pull up their IR material from the same period two years ago, it's clear that there is much work to be done to return to the same level of profits and revenues that they were at back in 2018-2019. What's more important to note, however, is that like a lot of retail industries that had been forced to adapt to the circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic, Amora Pacific undertook an initiative last year to upgrade their e-commerce platform while closing a large number of money-losing brick-and-mortar locations in both Korea and abroad. This was a move that has led to them shutting down all of their industry locations in the US and Canada in May of this year, and to be honest, that makes a lot of sense to me given the fact that they had only debuted in the North American market in 2017 and simply didn't have enough time in the region to expand their brand to a point where it would have been reasonable to keep the doors open in high rent places like Toronto's Yorkdale or Eaton Center. In addition to this, their sales in Asia are highly reliant on income from their Chinese locations where they'd at one point had a total of 600 industry stores open and accounts for over 70% of Amora Pacific's Asia sales. By the end of this year, the company plans to have shut down over half of these 600 locations, shifting towards an online e-commerce platform. This will definitely cut their cost of operations, but may also reduce their tangible presence in the market, so it's certainly something to watch. Now in terms of future growth, they have been shifting their focus towards more premium products and luxury lines. This is a trend that we've seen across the cosmetic sector during the pandemic as people have shifted either towards discount goods or premium luxury cosmetics, cutting out the middle area where Innisfree tends to take up. The company is also expanding into the commercial health and wellness innovation space with the launch of their personalizable supplement packages through My Vital Beauty, available at the Amori store Kwangyo. 
Basically, you're able to buy your own little package of vitamins based on your needs and your selection. On top of improving their e-commerce platform and restructuring their sales models in stores both domestically and abroad, they are also trying to innovate their products and focusing on developing more premium products for their customer base. Now, something important to note for us investors is that there are two separate listings for the company on the market. Amore Pacific Corp refers to their makeup cosmetic sector while Amore Group is the parent company behind them. Their stocks are listed separately and should be treated separately. Now this page from their 2020 audit details the holdings of the group in case you're curious. You'll notice that Amore Group owns most of the international subsidiaries in their entirety as well as other corporations like the Osalok Farm and Tea Museum in Jejudo, as well as Pacific Glass which is just a company that specializes in the manufacturing of cosmetics bottles and things of that nature. Now looking at their stocks, both companies have taken investors for a ride since the beginning of the year. At one point, Amoya Group hit a high up 38% year to date on June 2nd at 79,600 Korean won, before settling down over the course of the past two months to 57.6 thousand at the end of July. This reflects a 6.7% gain year to date, but is significantly lower than their 38% high. Similarly, Amara Pacific Corp shot up as high as 68.4% year-to-date to close at 297k at the end of May before dropping over the past two months, dropping a total of 5.5% over the last three trading days of July and closing at 221,501 but still up about 9% year-to-date. Now how important is this price action here? Not very since past prices don't dictate future prices, but it is a good way to gauge where investor sentiment has been up to this point of the year. And while it's fairly irrational for a stock's price to plummet in spite of great earnings growth from the previous year, we are under special circumstances with the coronavirus being as it is and the Delta variant picking up steam now. So with a price to earnings of over 100 for both companies' stocks, it's not clear exactly how much value investors can expect from a purchase at this point in time. This is why it's important to learn how to understand different methods of evaluating a stock like value-based free cash flow methods that can help you figure out whether or not a company can and will be more profitable than another alternative. Now as we noted in our last video for Hyundai Mobis, whether a dip in a stock's price is justified or unjustified is a judgement call entirely based on the eye of the beholder. And this holds true for a number of stocks like Samsung Electronics and LG Electronics who both posted massive earnings only to see their stocks drop a half percent and five percent respectively. And this is with LG posting its largest second quarter earnings sales since 2009. Now I did a bit of browsing today and the comment sections on Naver Finance are split between calling the market drop at the end of the month a perfect buying opportunity as well as others who think that it's all over whatever that means. At the end of the day, only you can decide what's going on with the stock and whether or not it's something that you want to dip your stick into. Alright, that's it for me. I'll be back, like I said at the beginning of next week, with an introduction to Celtrion and Hugel, both biotech companies that were requested on our previous video. Also, just a reminder that next week's IPO subscriptions start on Monday with Crafton of PUBG fame and Wanted Lab, an AI-based job recruitment and matching platform, both IPOs slated for the 5th of this month. Alright, catch you on the next one. Peace.